What's this? A letter for me. Welcome to another episode of Remember the Great Sports Through the Mail Thursdays. I'm going to share with you some recent returns that I got back in the mail and profile each of those players that signed for me. So let's just jump right into this. The first one's postmarked from Tennessee. It is from former Cleveland Indians pitcher Mike Paxton on four of four 1970s era cards. Uh, these are the only ones I had, so that's why I duplicated them up. But Mike graciously, graciously signed all four for me. So let me tell you about Mike Paxton and his career in baseball. Mike Paxton was originally drafted out of Oak Haven High School in Memphis, Tennessee by the New York Yankees in 1971, but did not sign and instead chose to go to Memphis State University, which is now Memphis University, after four seasons with the Memphis Tigers, in which he was a four-year letter winner, he was drafted by the Boston Red Sox in 1975. In 1975, he would split time between two single-A affiliates with the Red Sox, posting a 10-3 record, a 109 ERA, in 13 games. The following year, 1976, he would split time between double-A and triple-A, posting an 11-9 record in 27 games. For the Red Sox. Well, in 1977, he would be in AAA, and after seven immaculate starts in AAA, posting a 5-0 record with a .82 ERA, the Red Sox called him up on May 25, 1977 to Boston. That year in Boston as a rookie, he would split time between the bullpen and being a starting pitcher. He would start 12 games appearing in 29, posting a 3.83 ERA, and posting a 10-5 win-loss record that year for the Red Sox. Well, despite having such a strong, strong uh, outing with his one year with the Red Sox, on March 30, 1978, Mike Paxson was traded to the Cleveland Indians for future Hall of Famer Dennis Eckersley and catcher Fred Kendall. So this is how... Eck became a Boston Red Sox. Well, his first year in Cleveland, he posted a 12-win, 11-loss record with the Indians, starting 27 games that year for them and posting a 3.86 ERA. Well, the following year in 1979, he would post an 8-8 record, but his ERA would jump to 5.92 in 24 starts in 33 games. Well, in 1980, he just could not get his form back for the Indians, and in four games, he posted a 12.91 ERA that year and spent the majority of the season in AAA for the Indians. Well, in 1981, trying to make a bounce back, he did not uh, get a call back to the Indians during the 81 regular season, and at 27 years old, Mike decided to retire from baseball. Well... Uh, this is kind of neat where his path went after this. Uh, Mike actually was teammates with somebody in the minor leagues that actually was working for Nike. And if you remember in the 1970s, Nike was nowhere near what it is now. I mean, uh, Nike was just a small company, you know, from the northwestern uh, United States. And his friend got him involved with Nike. And for the next 30 years, after his playing career in baseball, Mike would spend his entire career working for Nike. So, pretty neat that he had the opportunity to move on, probably, and made more money working for that organization than he did playing baseball, to be honest with you. And if he has some stock interests, which I'm sure he did, being that he worked for the company, if you bought that stock in the early 80s, it definitely went up in the mid-80s and continues to grow probably to this day. So that's kind of a neat little tidbit about Mike Paxton that post-playing career. He had a very successful career working for Nike. So thank you, Mr. Paxton. We'll move on to the next one. All right, so this next one is postmarked from Virginia. And this is Virginia native Mike Cubbage on one and two is a player. A third is a player. I said that wrong. One and two is a coach and two is a player. So 
Let me tell you about Mike Cubbage and his career in baseball, both as a player and a coach. The left-handed hitting Cubbage grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, and came from a baseball family where his cousins were Larry Haney and Chris Haney, the pitcher for the Expos. Cubbage attended the University of Virginia, where he played for the Virginia Cavaliers baseball and football teams. Before he went to Virginia, Cubbage was originally selected by the expansion Washington Senators in 1968. He chose not to sign and instead went to Virginia and then was drafted again by the Washington Senators, this time in the second round in the 1971 draft. He spent part of four seasons in the minor leagues for the Washington Senators slash Texas Rangers. While he was part of their organization, they relocated to Texas, the modern day Texas Rangers. And on April 7th, 1974, the Rangers called him up to the major leagues where he would appear in nine games that year. However, he did not collect a hit and finished out the year in AAA. In 1975, he would start the season in AAA, but he would split time between both affiliates, and he would appear in 58 games for the Texas Rangers as a utility man. In 1976, he would spend just 14 games with the Texas Rangers, before he was traded to the Minnesota Twins for future Hall of Famer Burt Blylevin. So that's now two for two on guys that were traded for Hall of Famers in their career. Cubbage would make an immediate impact with the Twins as he would become like a super utility man and appeared in 104 games for the Twins that season. In 1977, he would again start the season in the major leagues with the Twins, and he would stick there this time, batting 264, appearing in 129 games for the Twins. 1978, he would appear in 125 games and post a respectable 282 batting average while doing so. 1979, he would appear in just 94 games for the Twins, and in 1980, he would appear in 103 games for the Twins. After the 1980 season concluded, he signed as a free agent with the New York Mets. He appeared in 67 games that year for the Mets and posted a 213 batting average while playing as a utility player. He would re sign with the Mets for the 1982 season. However, he would not get a call to the major league club and would primarily be used in the minor leagues for the Mets in their AAA affiliate, appearing in 113 games in 1982. Mike Cubbage would then, after his playing career, begin a stint of being a coach for the Mets organization. As you can see, he worked his way up through the Mets organization as a coach. Um, and obviously he coached the AAA All-Star team that year. After his time with the Mets, um, he actually served as the interim manager of the Red Sox during spring training one season. He remained on the staff that year after Grady Little was hired. Uh, after his time with the Red Sox, he bounced around a little bit doing various positions for other clubs, but most recently he worked for the Washington Nationals in their front office, you know, a special assistant or general manager type of assistant position. Uh, and he was there in 2019 when the Nationals won their World Series. But um, I read a recent article that after 50 years in baseball, Mike has decided to retire from the game. So again, this is one of those guys that had a lifelong career in baseball, you know, probably from his early 20s until his, you know, late 60s, early 70s, so to talk about a guy that had 50 years in baseball, you know, it's just one of those guys, again, that, uh, you know, I like to profile on this channel so we don't forget about him. So, thank you, Mr. Cubbage. I appreciate you signing for me, and we'll move on to the next one. All right, so the next one is postmarked from Florida, and it is former... Utility man Bob Baylor, primarily known for his time with the Toronto Blue Jays, but more importantly, I have his all time Orioles card that he signed, and he is sporting possibly the best pork chop sideburns in the history of a baseball card. I mean, just check out this card. 
check out those check out those sideburns. That is like the awesomest set of sideburns I've ever seen. So <laughs> let me tell you about Bob Baylor and his career in baseball. Baylor was born in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. He attended high school at a Catholic high school nearby, and he did not play baseball in high school. However, he did play high school basketball, and he actually set a team record for most points scored in the game at his high school. On the side, Baylor played baseball with the Connellsville American Legion team. It was through the American Legion that the Baltimore Orioles signed him to an undrafted free agent deal. Immediately upon graduation from high school, Baylor signed a professional contract with the Orioles. He immediately was a utility player playing the outfield, second base, third base, and shortstop, and even pitching for a game in his first pro season with the Bluefield Orioles. In 1971, with the Aberdeen Pheasants, Baylor led the Class A Northern League with a 340 batting average. In 1972, the following year, in the California League, he stole 63 bases. Eventually, he became playing more and more shortstop by the time he debuted with the Baltimore Orioles in September of 1975. He started both games of a September 28th doubleheader for the Orioles against the New York Yankees. One game at short, the other at second, and he collected his first major league hit off of Larry Gura in the second game. In 1976, he returned to AAA and again received a call to the majors that September. In total, over seven seasons in the Orioles organization, he batted 288 in their minor league affiliates. He was 3 for 13 with no home runs at the major league level. After the Seattle Mariners selected Rupert Jones from the Kansas City Royals with the first overall pick in the expansion draft, the Toronto Blue Jays made Baylor the second overall pick in the expansion draft that year. So this is the first person ever selected in the expansion draft by the Toronto Blue Jays. Despite the fact that he did not have an everyday position, so he was kind of thrown in the lineup everywhere, Baylor appeared in 122 games and logged 520 plate appearances his rookie season in Toronto. He led the team in hits, stolen bases, runs scored, and a 310 batting average, which set an expansion team record for an expansion team their first year in the league. Another impressive fact about uh, Baylor is he came to the plate 51 times before he struck out in his major league career. In 1978 and 1979, Baylor emerged as the Jays' regular right fielder, though he still played many different positions, so super utility man. In 1978, he drove in a career-high 52 runs while striking out just 21 times in 621 at-bats. He was named the Blue Jays Player of the Year for the first two years of the franchise's existence. Baylor's production declined in 1979 as he batted only just 229 with one home run and 38 RBIs in 130 games. In 1980, Baylor lost his full-time right field job to up-and-coming Lloyd Mosby and was used as the fourth outfielder for that season. He also appeared in three games as a relief pitcher, allowing two earned runs in two and one innings pitched. On December 12th, after that season, the Blue Jays traded Baylor to the New York Mets for pitcher Roy Lee Jackson. Baylor spent a month on the disabled list with a ribcage injury and was used sparingly in his first season in New York, appearing in just 51 games and logging just 81 at-bats. He went into spring training in 1982 competing for either of the two middle infield positions. With both Baylor Moore and Wally Backman both batting over 300 at the end of May, Baylor began seeing more playing time at short and third base. He ended the season with 404 plate appearances, his most since 1979. He stole a career high 20 bases and led the National League with an 87% stolen base percentage. He began the 1983 season as the Mets starting infielder. He appeared in 118 games that year, batting 250 and stole 18 bases. 
Well, after the 1983 season concluded, the Mets traded him to the Los Angeles Dodgers for Sid Fernandez. Now, I know Sid Fernandez was not a Hall of Famer like the other two guys, uh, Eckersley and Blylevin, but Sid Fernandez was a very integral part of the Mets organization, you know, especially when they won their World Series in 86. He would be used as a part-time player in Los Angeles and actually posted a 275 batting average in 1984 for the Dodgers in 65 games. In 1985, he would bat just 246 in 74 games for the Dodgers, and after the 85 season concluded, Bob Baylor was released from his contract from the Dodgers. Shortly after his release from the Dodgers, Baylor was offered a position with Toronto. He stayed retired for a season, and then a year later, he accepted a position with the organization managing the Florida State League, the Niden Blue Jays. Baylor went on to manage in Syracuse from 1988 to 1991 and was named the International League Manager of the Year in 1989. From 1992 to 1995, Baylor served as a coach with the Toronto Blue Jays, and as all of you know, the Blue Jays won their back-to-back -back World Series in 92 and 93, so Baylor was on that team as a coach. So, very happy to add the great Bob Baylor to my collection. His story is so unique that he was discovered in American Legion baseball. The kid didn't even play on his high school baseball team, and he would go on to have an excellent career in the minor leagues, you know, long-term major league career, and then would turn that career into a managing position in the minor leagues, eventually becoming part of Cito Gaston's coaching staff in the major leagues and winning the World Series. So, very excited to share the story of Bob Baylor to you about how he came from out of nowhere, basically, to play in baseball. Very happy to share Mike Cubbage autographs with you as well. The one I forgot to mention is Cubbage is in um, University of Virginia's Hall of Fame as a baseball and football player. I also want to thank Mr. Paxton, who was a great college athlete as well. And I want to thank you for taking the time for enjoying another episode about some players that you may not be familiar with. I look forward to your comments below, and as always, happy collecting.